Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm hoping that this will give you some um, tips and tricks to get started, or if you've been working on it, some, some ways to get over some hurdles that you may have run into in your research and ideas of where to look for, for other resources. Uh, Natalie, can yeah. I ask a question? Sure. Um, I'm not from Ohio. I'm mm -hmm. from the East Coast. So will this apply to the East Coast as well? Yes, I will talk about if you're not in Ohio, <laughs> what to okay. look for in, in other states. Uh, unfortunately, okay. and I'll talk about this, there is no across the board for anything, um, not even within a state for how people keep their records. So um, okay. it's, it's different by county and it's different by state. So, um, but I have some, some just general things and some online resources that will apply to all states as well. So I'm sorry, my slides are advancing on their own. Okay, so <laughs> I'll start with um, where to look. Um, we've got, I've got some pictures of places here. We've got um, our building. Uh, downtown. Uh, I always tell people the one with the clock tower, if they haven't been there before, we're, you know, we're, we're easy to pick out. And then here's some of our wonderful volunteers uh, that are, uh, these are some of my regular Wednesday volunteers that are going to be coming back uh, this week and next, finally, um, working on a uh, processing project. Um, we do most of our processing of collections out in the open, so we use as a teaching experience for people to let them know um, what we're working on, why these records are important. Um, they're work, we're working on a, a project of processing our probate court records, which I'll talk about in a little bit about what you can get out of probate court records. Um, but there's also the Clark County Public Library, um, the information desk, Kathy Hackett there. She's uh, great and has other people that work with her that can help you. Um, if you go to that desk in the middle past the, the main checkout, they can help and they have, um, I think their microfilm readers might still be down right now. They're not letting people use them, but they have microfilm readers at the back with lots of different microfilm. And I'll talk about some of the specific microfilm that they have available there later. Um, the New Carlisle Public Library, um, where I've done uh, this presentation before, they can help with um, research and um, all of the other uh, Clark County Library branches um, can help as well. Uh, at the courthouse, you can go to Common Pleas, which is on the second floor. And uh, the uh, Probate is on the fifth floor and municipal is on the second floor there. So there's records there that might be able to help you. I've got, this is the New Carlisle Library here. This is the public library. This is the main uh, courthouse. And then this is the municipal building here. Uh, if you're outside uh, Clark County, like, like you said, but you're um, so still in Ohio, um, like every county is different as to where they're kept. Uh, for example, uh, Warren County and Greene County both have uh, archival record centers. Uh, Clark County does not have that. Um, the record center would be um, responsible for like records retention of, of county offices that keep for a certain amount of years. You know, they have to, um, everything that comes to the Historical Society at the Heri our Heritage Center archives stays forever. We do not have retention schedules. We do not destroy stuff after a certain period of time. If it comes to us, it's a historical record that get, gets kept. The difference between us and our archives um, in, our, in a record center is that they would have a retention schedule for certain um, county uh, and government offices. Uh, so in Greene and Warren County, there's a lot of the records that you have that are vital records like birth, death, and marriage. You would go to those record centers. You wouldn't, um, they do have a historical society in Greene County and Warren County, but the record center is where most of those records are. So if you're looking for a certain county in Ohio, you may just do a Google search first and see if a historical society exists and call them first and see, do you guys have the records? They might say, no, we don't have the records. You need to go to the county courthouse and they can maybe give you the information there. So it really, um, unfortunately, there's not any like set thing across the board for every county that they have to, that these people keep the records and that's how it's done. It's just however it's done in, in that county. A good place to start if you're not sure where to start in Ohio is with the Ohio History Connection Library and Archives. I have their phone number and email on there. Um, and they have uh, some records that cover across the state, but they can also help put you in the right direction for the county that you're looking for. Um, if you know the county, I would check there first. Um, a lot of people I get, I get researchers that they, like I got one the other day that called in and they were trying to narrow down to about eight different possible counties that they thought their person might have been in. So they were calling all of them. They knew they were just in Southwest Ohio. So they'd kind of narrowed it down a little bit. Um, so they had to check with each county separately um, to see if they, they had an idea. Um, a good thing about online sources, uh, familysearch.org is free. Uh, and Ancestry.com is a pay site. 
but um, they're both run by the Church of Latter-day Saints. So um, just separate, I, just, they're still, they're separate entities from each other, but uh, Family Search has a lot of great records um, from different states. And the, the thing that they have that I like best about Ohio is you can find the death records online uh, between a certain uh, time period between 1908 and 54, which I have on a later slide. Um, but they, they have a good general search function that if I don't know where I'm starting, I have no idea what county or even what state I'm in, I can go there first and just go under the general search bar and type in the information that I know about the person I'm looking for. And um, I know that it'll crawl a whole bunch of different states and, and counties and everything. So that's, those are good places to start. Ancestry as well, but like I said, that's, that's not a free site. Um, we use our membership, um, our institutional membership for the Heritage Center to do that. But also when the library is allowing um, people um, regular access, they do have ancestry membership that people can use on their public computers there at the, the public library next door to us. Uh, I'm going to go through a couple of specific records um, that are available. Um, I usually go in order birth, death, and marriage. Um, so I'll start with, with births. Um, we'll take requests in person by phone, email, and letter. Um, and then we've got our online form on our, on our Heritage Center website where people can submit requests. Um, we have two different resources for birth records, uh, either probate or health department. Um, a lot of people will call us and say, I called the health department looking for a birth record and they said it was too early, so they sent me to you. So that's how we get people to us because the health department knows that if their record falls before, if the record they're looking for falls before 1908, that they need to come to us. So we have anything between 1867 and 1908. And um, depending on which record you're, you're looking for, it, it falls into a different um, area. So probate, I, I have the dates on here, is 1867 to 1908. And then health department records start 20 years later in 1887 to 1908. Um, yeah. The, I had gone to the health department on some, some of my aunts and uncles, mm -hmm. just had little index cards. So at some point, they didn't issue death certificates? Yes. So I tell people when they contact us for records, we will only have either, we have the original books and we have the original books microfilmed and we have cards. We cannot provide the quintessential looking birth or death record that people see. It, it does not exist for that time period. I know that at the health department, they can generate a typed one and they can notarize it. But for the time period, the earlier time period, it just can't be done. So I tell people, I can give you a printout of the original book and hopefully, you know, if you're trying to get into DAR or SAR or something like that, you know, they will accept that record. I, I know that they will, but um, some things I'm always, I'm always um, stymied by is when people call and they say, I can't get into DAR unless I prove this birth that was in, you know, 1815. And I say, well, we absolutely cannot prove it because they don't exist. And I have this big note, this note down here, there are not any birth records in the state of Ohio for any county prior to 1867. There is nothing official. So I get all the time people saying, well, I need to prove this to get into DAR. And I said, well, we'll have to try and prove it another way, but there will not be a birth record. They just don't exist. Uh, so I always, uh, we have uh, index cards for the health department. So like if someone calls, I can do a really quick run over to our index card file and look through that. Um, but if they don't show up in those cards, I have to go to the microfilm to look for probate. Um, and I always tell people they might show up in one record and not the other. They may show up in both and they may not show up at all. That does not mean that you were wrong, that they weren't born here. Um, I, I, we get a lot of people that just do not appear in either record uh, because prior to um, 1910, when everything goes over to the health department only, it's really just sometimes hit or miss that people did not report the births, um, like if someone was born at home or something, it just, it does not get recorded. Um, so that does not mean that they're on the wrong track or anything. It just means we can't, we can't prove it with the records that we have. Um, I don't know if I have this cost right anymore for the health district, but it was $22 um, a couple of years ago when I, when I did this, but I know the cost has gone up over the years. If you, if you get one of those notarized ones there for anything 1908 and above, and I learned this when I needed to get a, a new birth record for, well, get birth records for my kids and myself to get our um, passports that you can get, you can now get for any Ohio County. So I'm from 
Summit County originally. So I was trying to figure out how I'm going to get up to Summit County and, you know, get to the office to get the, the records that I needed. And when I went to get my kids at Clark County's at, um, health department, they said, oh, well, you can get any Ohio County now um, if you, if it's your own birth record or anyone, you know, you can't, you can get for other people as well. But I think you have to prove a uh, connection to that person if you're trying to get their birth record. Um, so I was able to um, to get mine at, at Clark County, even though I wasn't born here. So that's a newer thing um, that makes makes things a little bit easier if you, you need, need to get your own. As for adoption records, um, that's a, a tougher thing. Um, anything between um, 1964 and 96, you can get them from the Ohio Department of Health. Um, but prior to 1964, um, you can apl apply for getting the records. I know there were some new laws that were passed in the last few years that have opened up more, more records that were not available to people. We do not have adoption records. We, we may have um, our probate index sometimes indicates that a case was an adoption case, but we are not allowed to have those records. That means that the case was existed, they pulled it out before they gave it to us. So we have the originals, but they've pulled out re records that are deemed not accessible um, to, directly to the public. So they were pulled out. We do, however, have a little um, booklet of adoption listings that were hand copied by one of our volunteers back in the 70s. She went to the courthouse and she had um, gotten a book and she hand copied all of the adoptions that she could find um, between 1861 and 42. And we were able to, uh, so, so that's a, a resource that we have available. Um, and I don't think it's all inclusive. Um, it does seem to be that, you know, there are definitely some missing from there, but at least it's a, a resource that we can help people with if they come in and are looking for an adoption. Uh, marriage records are um, also in a couple of different re uh, resources. Um, they're, they're recorded in probate, um, but we have them in a couple different places at, at the Heritage Center. Um, we have the original marriage books, which are um, aside from the first book, the first book is very tiny. It's about this big and um, it has the, the, the records handwritten in it. And then as you get into later years, you'll, you'll have typed records and they look more like the, the typical marriage records that people will, 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 um, will, will picture in their mind. Um, so we've got the large books for those. And uh, we also have uh, microfilm indexes and book indexes for those. So whenever people come into the library, we've got two sets of red and blue books. And depending on what years they're looking for, they'll grab the red or the blue books and, and, and they can look up the person they're looking for. But the problem with our index is that it only goes up to 1925. Um, prior, after 1925 at the Heritage Center, we don't have an index that we can look up. We have the books, but we don't, we don't have an index for them. So usually people will have to at least give us a ballpark year of when they think the person was married. But the, the quick shortcut I do is I just call probate and I say, I need the marriage for this people. Can you tell me what year and date it was on? And they can usually give me the exact page number and then I can go grab the book and, and find them what they're looking for. Um, Cause I like to, I mean, I could send them to probate to do it, but I, if they're already there, you know, I'm gonna try and find it for them. Um, but um, probate court has them as well. But with COVID right now, I know that restrictions are very tight with um, them allowing people to do research or even them looking up research for people. I had someone call the other day that was looking for a divorce, which we also don't have. Um, but they told them to call us for the divorce, which we definitely don't have it. And they told them that they could not help with it because it was a genealogical request. And I said, well, normally they can. Um, and I think, and basically she said she went in in person and she was told, give us your email and here's a phone number to call you have to leave. Like they would not even allow her in, to stay in the office. So I know it's not normally like that. So I think that's COVID restrictions right now. Um, one of our volunteers, uh, Flossie, who's with the Genealogical Society, she'll often go to probate to look records up for people. Um, I'll help people, but I really don't go beyond our building. I'll, I'll help people with what they can find at, um, at the Heritage Center and I'll tell them where they, where they can find the other records, but I won't, I won't travel to any of the other um, county buildings or government buildings to look it up for them. But Flossie, she will do that um, because she does research on behalf of the Genealogical Society. So she's someone that can help with that in normal circumstances, but um, I don't believe she would even be able to get access to some of that now. Um, but uh, we also, they have a marriage card index at probate. Um, we have marriages on index cards 
in the um, the Heritage Center that are cross-referenced with some of those early marriages. So people, um, that's a good place to start if people aren't really sure what years or what they're looking for, they can just do a last name lookup for the person in our index card. Um, so the, can I ask you a question that says that I, I can't see, it says divorce records are available through domestic what? A domestic relations court. And this, I am not sure if, if that is true anymore, especially since the, the, I got two divorce calls this last week of people that were not, they went to where they thought they could get the records and they were told they could not get the records. So I'm not sure. Um, I, this, is, this would be um, the second floor, which would be where they had gone. Um, and they were told that they couldn't get them right now. But I think normally that, that those records are available through domestic, that would be part of um, Common Pleas, I believe. Um, which is on the second floor uh, there. But again, that would vary from county to county and state to state where you might find those records, um, who, who holds them. Um, but common pleas, a divorce would generally fall into a common pleas. Um, common pleas, okay. And, and I, I believe any, anywhere. Um, okay, as for, thanks. As for death records, uh, we have again with same same thing with the health department or the the with birth records. We also have probate and health department, and it's the same span of years, 1867 to 1908, and then 20 years later for the health department ones. Um, the thing that is nice about the the card records for the, the that we have for the health department um, is that the cards for for births actually give you a lot more information typed right there on the card. It'll give you the parents' names, the doctors' names the date of birth um, and so so sometimes that's enough for people you know they get they have all the information that they need right there on the card um, but we, we can still go to the original books um, in the microfilm and print off the information for them as well and that gives it just in a separate format on a you know in a, a line by line um, format to, to look at that instead um, well, I didn't mention this with the birth uh, with the uh, the death records for the health department, they just have month and year. Uh, they don't give you any information about the death. You, you, you have to go to the record to get more information uh, on, on their index card. So I'm not sure the difference between why, you know, whoever was trained to type up, you know, they, it was two different systems that they kept at the same department, but they didn't, uh, they didn't put all the extra information about the deaths in the, um, the index cards. Uh, and then again, you can get death records at the at the health district um, if you if it's especially if, if it's after 1908, they'll, they'll have them there. And same thing with birth records. There's no deaths before 1867. So you can't confirm that a lot of times if people are trying to confirm a death. I try and find it another way like um, we'll check probate and it will at least give us maybe their last filing date for their will that'll give us close to when their death date was. Um, but it's very difficult to pin down an exact death date in a, in a public record. Um, you might find it on, you know, their, their headstone or something. Um, but uh, you just kind of have to get creative sometimes to figure out how you can narrow it down. Uh, a little bit more about probate records. We've got a picture of one over here. This is a, a folded uh, record. The, the picture I had earlier of the volunteers, they were unfolding them and putting them into um, legal size folders. Um, that helps preserve them better um, than them being all bunched up in their original folder. So that was a, a large project that we did a number of years ago. And it also helped us kind of get a better idea of what was in those records. It was neat to look through them and get a better idea of what kinds of things you could find in probate. And it gave me a better handle on, on um, what they have. So if someone died in, in the county that you're researching in, you'll want to try and search for them in probate. Just because they died there doesn't mean they'll be in probate, though, if they didn't have anything to settle or um, in land or property, you might not, they might not appear. Um, but I know that, you know, if you're looking in Clark County, we have the records, uh, probate has the records. So there's two places where you can find the records. They have them on microfilm. We have the originals um, that were given to us after they were microfilmed. Um, so if you're in another county, you just check with the historical society of the probate court or that courthouse to find out who has those records. Um, you can find wills. Um, those are in the estate packets here, but also uh, they're in, at least in Clark County, they are also in separate will books. So I will get somebody that will call me and say, I need will book two, page 37. And I know that they must have gotten that from some, you know, source online or something like that. So I can 
we don't have those will books. So I tell them, well, I can't find it that way, but I can go look up their name and find their case and their will will be in the case. Um, so we, we do not have the will books, but probate does. Um, but we do still have the will because we'll have the physical copy of the will that was in, was in the case packet. Um, as far as terminology goes with probate, um, if they died without a will, it will say, that, you know, they died in test it. Um, and then it will list an administrator on their estate. So that's kind of a, a shortcut, like when, when, cause we have our, ours, our cases are all listed in a big index and, you know, someone will, will go write down the case number and I'll say, oh, what did it say next to the case? Did it say they had an administrator or an executor? And they said, oh, it said it was an administrator. And I say, okay, that means you're not going to find a will. They didn't have a will. So that's because uh, it doesn't always um, spell it out exactly that, you know, they, they had a will or not. But if you see administrator, you know, they did not have one. Um, if they have an executor, that's somebody executing their will. So, you know, that, that that's what they, um, that you will, that you should find a will in their estate packet. Uh, with guardianship cases, uh, those can be kind of tricky because if there were like five or six children, it will be listed under one of the children's names, not all of them. If they're not, at least in our county, they're not cross-referenced. It will be listed under just one of the child's names and that it will say, so like say there was William, Susie, Bill, or William, Susie, and Steve, it'll say William, comma, Smith, and then et al for all of the other children. So sometimes in order to locate them, you do need to find more of the children's names. The way our indexes are, are, um, are set up, it's, they're alphabetical, but then it's alphabetical by last name, but then you have to know the first name of who you're looking for. And that starts on a different page. So, um, so like Smith comma William will be back on page 50 and you know Smith comma Steve will be on page 45 so if 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 you if you can find out the name of like all six children you can look under all of them I would start with the oldest child but that's I've also found that it's not always the case either that it's not always you would you would expect it to be the oldest child but um I found with researchers and if you've done your own research, you may find, you don't, you don't necessarily follow every part of a line. You know, you might know that someone has, they had six children, but you only know the names of five of them, but it doesn't really matter to you because only one is your direct line. So, um, so we find, we have books in our, in our, in our resources where people will see, um, will have just, you know, parts of the line that they've researched a little bit more and you might find other researchers have pulled in more information. You can kind of connect them together and realize, okay, here's the same line. And from this researcher, I've pulled out a little more information. Um, but I always tell people to take, take anything that they find from um, in some of our resources with a grain of salt because um, people do not follow all, you know, they're not following all parts of their lines. So they might have some, some um, bits and pieces that are um, not all together, but it's helpful when you find things like that to get like all of the names of the children, even if you weren't researching all of those children, you can at least know where to start with the guardianship case. And as with guardianship, it doesn't necessarily mean that both parents are dead. Um, even if the mother is still alive, uh, back in the turn of the century, they still would have had a guardianship case because they would have had to assure that the children were provided for because the mother could not be, um, as a woman, could not be uh, trusted to, to provide for the children. So they had to go through the courts to do that. So um, that's just the way things were. So you'll, you, know, you know, that doesn't mean that they were orphaned. Um, but those, those can be a little bit tricky to figure out what, what name you're looking under. Uh, and then, uh, like I said, they have the microfilm at the at, at probate. Um, and then, when you look for our, our indexes, you'll you'll get the case number, which is now very important because um, when we had our flood in 2019, we had to take all the cases out. And when they came back, they're no longer in order, so we had to renumber the outsides of the boxes. So we have to know we have to know the case number to know which box we need to go to now. It used to just be you know they were in order numerically, and you could just go roughly about where, where you needed, but now you need to know exactly which case number you need uh, to find it again. Um, but I had mentioned before that some cases are pulled out, adoptions are pulled out, lunacy cases are pulled out. So if someone is listed as um, a lunatic, um, you know that that case is probably not going to be in our records. 
We know that it existed because it's in the index, but we, you won't be able to get the details of the case. But I found that cases like that that are technically lunacy cases, and it's usually cases of dementia, the person had dementia or, you know, Alzheimer's, um, you know, and people didn't really quite understand that. So they get, they get, you know, say, okay, this person can no longer care for themselves or handle their own affairs. They get labeled as lunacy, a, a lunatic case. And then, um, but those slip through if they get labeled as a guardianship case rather than lunacy. So they're saying, okay, we're assigning a guardian to this person. So my figure is that when people started to go through to pull out the cases that were not allowed to be there, they just went down the line and ignored the guardian ones. And that's how some of the ones slipped through because technically it was an adult guardianship, which meant it was more of a lunacy case, but it got labeled on the index as guardian. So it slips through. Natalie, so there's no record of those any place? No, they're, they, they are still at probate. I don't know if they were microfilmed, but you could go to them with a case number. Um, and that's the thing with, with records being the, the new law that was passed as far as records now being a certain age that people can access them. I can't remember. I don't know the details of that law, but it was one that was finally passed, I think, in 2018, that they were fighting to have records released that were at least a certain age. So the privacy of the case would no longer come into effect if it's past a certain amount of years. So I think that's the matter of those were considered to be a privacy issue and, and not available directly. But I believe they do, they would still exist. They were not destroyed. They just were not sent to us um, when, when the records were given to the, to the historical society. Other types of records um, that we have are land and property records. Um, a lot of people do this when they're researching their, their house, um, you know, who lived in, on the land before then. And uh, we have at the Heritage Center only the index books. So you can look up and see between the years of 1811 and 1870 when and where land was bought and sold. So it'll tell you, you know, this person sold land to this person on this date and it was in this location. You can get that much information. But the deed itself that gives you more detail about who else was involved in the sale or other children that might be connected, those are available at the Clark County Public Library on microfilm. Um, so I'll, a lot of times I'll have people go ahead and into our index, write down the information they need, the volume and page number, and then they can take that over to the library and say, okay, I need the microfilm for this volume and page number, and then they can print the deed that they need. So you have to use the two, the two resources together. And the library also has the indexes that we have on microfilm. So if people start at the library, they can get both resources. But if they start with us, I at least want to get them um, going in the right direction as to, to finding the land that they're looking for. Uh, you can also find uh, land records on the recorder's office uh, and the auditor's office. I just bought a house. So I know that I went to the auditor's office. I've got a screenshot of the next one and you know put in the address of the house we were looking for and i um they have a map view so if you scroll out to the map view you can click on the little boxes for every property around you so you better bet i i clicked on every single house in like a <coughs> three block radius to see who lived there who how long ago they bought it how much they bought it for um so i know that our our auditor's office is really great in that information and then that'll give you the the property and tax information for the past at least several years and the last several sales. Um, but you, on the website, and at least for the auditor's office, you can only find the last few owners um, that are there. And I always tell people, if you're doing research on your house and you go to the auditor's office and it says your house was built in 1900, do not believe that. Your house is probably <laughs> older. 1900 is the default um, date that they put on stuff. Um, it means that it's, it's almost definitely earlier than this. Um, and I've got the direct links here for, so when I send this, you can see if I mouse over it, it shows me how to click on it. So, the, so when I send you this, you can click through um, from the, the PowerPoint. But here's what the auditor's page looks like. So I put in, this is the Heritage Center. Um, we are technically owned by the Board of Commissioners and we, we rent the building from them. Um, but you can see the little blue box here um, that's on the screen. When you zoom out and you can see all the properties around you, as you click, you'll see the boxes appear for the various properties. So you can click on the different parcels of land and see, okay, who owns 
like so this is you know now the cohatch uh, former you know uss former ma market um, you can click here and see who the current owners are how much they bought it for and and all of that information um, so it's a really useful tool for um, researching an area and um, especially you know if you're looking to buy the house to get a better idea of what everything around it is worth and and who else lives around you and things like that um, I don't know if everybody does that, but I was very stalkery about it, but I figured that's what I do for a living. So I was going to be thorough if I was looking up, uh, looking stuff up. Uh, there's the other great resources are atlases and maps. Um, this is the map that we have on the wall at the uh, Heritage Center right when you come off the elevator. It's a 1855 map of Clark County. It's the oldest one we have. I believe there may be older ones that exist. We have to get those through the engineer's office. Um, which is located out on um, on 40 across from um, the movie theater at the um, Springview uh, Government Center, which again has limited hours right now. Um, and uh, this map, I, I we have a copy of this on our wall at our house. Uh, the, I, I, I love looking at this to, to it kind of orients you as to why streets are named what they are, because you can see the landowners in that area. like. Um, like this here in the middle is is sit is Springfield proper, but you can see you know that Henry Bechtel owned a whole lot of land on the area that's now Bechtel Avenue, so it's it's nice to to look at this um, throughout the whole county and figure out oh that's why that street's named that and you know that that kind of thing. So th these are just a neat it's a neat resource anyway, but it's very helpful especially when people come in um, to the Heritage Center that are doing research on properties out in the county. I'll figure out okay which township are you in and we can go over and look at the map and see okay. You, you lived in section 35 of German Township. Let's see who was there in 1855. And then that gives them a starting point for um, if they wanted to go to the deed indexes, they could have a name to start with to figure out um, more about their land. Uh, but places that they have them, we've, we've got atlases at the, at the Heritage Center in our library. Um, public library has them and the engineer's office has the atlases and I've got a list here of the atlases that are available. These are the only ones that exist for the area. So the 1870 atlas uh, is a good one. The 1875 is really great because it has sketches in it. That's a really fun one. It's got sketches of homes and, and, and um, buildings and, and things like that. The 1882 atlas is just for the city of Springfield. Uh, it's got a lot of great detail um, street by street um, that you can look and see um, what buildings structures were made of and, and, and information like that. So that's really helpful. Um, the 1894 Atlas is the last one that's available for Clark County and it has uh, pictures in it. Um, actual pictures of uh, people and uh, places around town. So that's, that's a really neat one as well. Um, but there's a big gap then after that. There's not really any atlases after 1894. But another resource that I have down here is Sanborn maps, um, which we have uh, several of these in, in um, the research library that you can page through and you have to look by section. Um, so you would go to the index and it has a, a map at the front with, with numbers on it. So you find the area of this. The, the, so if you're looking for High Street, it would say, okay, High Street properties are on pages 67 through 70 and then you would go back and go through 67 through 70 and it would tell it would get it break down into more detail the houses that fall into those streets. Um, so those are uh, uh, the Sanborn maps were used by um, their for insurance purposes um, by fire departments. So they knew that a structure was was wooden or um, cement block or, you know, it told them the makeup of the structure. So they're color coded that way. Um, when you look at those maps. So those are, those are a really neat resource. Um, and the, the problem that I have with the Sanborn maps is that, um, for example, we have a 1928 one through 1956. So when, when the engineer's office would do updates, they would just print out the new part of the map that was replacing the old map, and it would be glued over the old map. So you, we no longer have access to what it looked like underneath. So we can see a page that may have tons of layers on it. You can see that it's been added to over the years, but you can't, you can't go backwards and see what's underneath. And that, that always bothers me that I wish there was another way that had been done that we could kind of go back in time and see what the changes were. Sometimes you can see through it enough that you can see, oh yeah, there was an, used to be another building under there, but it always, it always drives me nuts because 
um, they weren't thinking historically minded, you know, they were thinking that this was easier, the easiest way to do it, but they were covering up um, information that would have been very useful to people. Um, I don't know if this is accurate anymore, but you used to be able to get to those Sanborn maps online um, through the library. Um, but you would have to put in your library card pin number to access that part. But I don't know if they have a current membership there. They'd have to have their, their access um, still current there. Um, and then other great resources that I use daily um, are Google Maps and Bing Maps and Instant Street View. Um, I, I submit the then and now pictures to the newspaper where I'll send them an old photo and they have to get the now picture. And I've done the presentation about that for you guys before. Um, but that's how I get my exact locations most of the time. So if I have an exact address, I'll, I'll put it into Google Maps so I can orient myself. And then a lot of times, you know, then I can, I can email the paper and say, okay, here's the picture. You need to stand here at this spot to get, to get the now picture. Um, so I use those three websites very frequently to, to orient myself as to where things are now. Um, so great resource, especially get a lot of people saying, you know, my family used to live in this house. Does it still exist? And, you know, we can, you can find out really quickly. But the, the problem with uh, doing that with addresses is that, um, especially if they lived for closer to the downtown of Springfield, um, addresses changed by about, uh, we, I haven't figured out like the exact number, but the, so like if you lived in the 500 block in 1908 and then they changed the addresses, in the 1910 directory, you'll live in like 1500. So it changes by about a thousand, but that's again, not for sure. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, um, but you, I do know that, you know, if someone has, if someone is going off of a, you know, an 1890 census that says that somebody, except I, that was a bad example because the 1890 census doesn't exist. The 1900 census, um, if you go to the 1900 census and it says that they lived at, you know, 535, um, South Fountain, you would need to jump ahead to the 1910 directory to see what that address became um, to be able to find out what that location is now. And that's um, a case with, you know, people doing research, we found that houses that we thought may have been torn down still existed. They were just under a different address. Um, that was the case with um, like Lillian Gish's home. Um, the actress that was born in Springfield, they, for the longest time, they thought that her house was gone, but when they figured out what the new, the current address was, they, they found that the house was still standing. So just another obstacle that people run into doing research in Springfield, and I'm sure in other cities, there's, there's instances of addresses changing over the years, but the, that's the big, the big change between 1908 and 1909. So, so to get over that hurdle, you have to check the 1908 and then you have to check the 1910 and compare the addresses and hope that people lived in the same spot. If they moved, you're screwed. <laughs> but but you, that's that's how you can you can get over that gap of the change. Um, and then a little bit more about directories, which is where you where you find this information. Um, most many many cities have directories on Ancestry. If you do have a membership, a lot of them are on Ancestry. I am lazy. And often I will just sit at my desk and search Ancestry, even though the books are sitting 10 feet away from me. Um, but it's sometimes it's a lot easier because I can just click through like 15 years in like three minutes as opposed to sitting on the floor and pulling out all the books and, and flipping through them. Uh, so it just depends on um, how many years I need to look at at a time and what span of years I sometimes will just do it online. But the problem with um, Springfield directories is they only have up through 1960 online. So if I'm looking at anything more modern, I need to go to the physical books um, anyways. But up in the, um, at the Heritage Center, we have 1852 um, through printed 2012. We have a, a 2012 directory is the latest one we have. Um, they also have them at the public library. Um, but I know that due to COVID, at least when we first, uh, in the fall, they were not allowing people to access those books at all. Um, we did get a lot of people that got sent over to us to, to use our directories instead, because um, they're a heavy use item. And I think they decided that it was just too difficult. Um, we are a little bit lower use place, so I didn't feel so bad about people um, using them. But, uh, but yeah, they, 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 they're not a non-circulating item, but they, they did get a lot of handling over there. So they had shut that down for at least a, a, a little while. I'm not sure what their um, policies are right now. Um, we also have rural directories. 
Um, they are very spotty. Um, we have a couple from the early 1900s and we go up through about the 1950s, but we probably only have about maybe 20 total. So um, if people lived out in the county, they're not quite as easy to trace as they are in the um, city of Springfield proper. Uh, but they're really great for telling you where somebody lived, um, their spouse's names. But if you're looking prior to the 1890s, a woman's, the wife's name is not listed with her husband. Um, after the 1890s, she's listed. And then later, um, if she's a widow, she's listed as, you know, such and such widow of John Smith. Um, once you're over 18, you're listed. So that's a good way to track how many children are in the household that are over 18. So you, if you go to a last name and you see a whole bunch of people that are at the same address, you know, that, that lets you know that those were, must have been the children and that they're at the time of the directory, at least over 18. Um, occupations for the people are listed and um, they have a handy abbreviation index included in, in, in the directory to let you know what some of those abbreviations are for various um, types of jobs. And it's good for, um, if they own the business themselves, it'll list them as the, you know, manager or president or um, whatever, whatever their title is, is, is the owner um, of the business. And then the address of that business is usually listed. So oftentimes, you know, if it gives you a person's name, it'll have um, their occupation, their home address, and their, their business address. Um, and you can do reverse lookup starting in 1915. So prior to 1915, unfortunately, you can't do that. Um, which is which stinks because that would really help make that whole uh, figuring out the addresses a lot easier if the reverse address had started a lot earlier. But um, you can do so you can go to the address you're looking for and it'll tell you who is there. Um, I use that all the time to try and write our then and now captions to figure out exactly where something was and how long it was there. Uh, other resources are county histories. These are the specifically the ones for Clark County, but for the state of Ohio, um, beers is, there's beers histories for most of the counties in Ohio. Um, that's the, the um, publisher. Um, and then for other, other states, if you're looking at other states, they'll, they'll probably be some sort of county history like that. And the thing with the county histories is that people paid to have their, um, their profile in there. So I kind of take those with a grain of salt too, <laughs> because you could, you know, make yourself sound really great. Uh, not, you know, and, and, uh, and the other interesting things about those county histories is that it will say that, um, you know, Bob Smith lived uh, here near where this person lived. So they're assuming some knowledge of that, you know, where this other person lived, or they'll say, you know, they were five clicks from this tree that doesn't exist anymore. Same thing you see with, with land records that may be described that way. Um, they'll refer to, to landmarks that no longer exist. So um, some of those county histories are a little bit difficult to kind of to line them up to today because they may be referencing things that um, they assume knowledge on the part of the reader that, you know, 100 years later or more, we're not going to have that knowledge. Um, so we need to do a little more research to figure out what they're talking about. But these are direct links here that when I send these, you'll, you'll be able to go directly to either the index for some of these, or in some cases, you'll actually be able to look at the text of, of the, um, the various county histories. Um, but as you can see, the most recent, well, 1908, but there is, there's also a 1923 Prince history. I don't know if that's on the next page. No, I forgot that one. So there's one from 1923 that's by Prince. That's about as modern as we got as far as county histories go. And then there's the Heartland exhibit book that the Heritage Center put out in 2001. And Dr. Kinnison's History of Springfield and Clark County um, from, I think, 1983 or 84. So there's a big gap in, 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 in overall histories of the area. Um, but they are, they are a good resource. Uh, Especially, I use them all the time to get information about, you know, when this building was built or um, how long that school's been there or who taught at that school or, you know, things like that. That, that kind of in interesting information is in there. And if you're using the index, like, for example, the Rockle index here, you can look up the surname that you're looking for and it'll tell you where it appears in the book. And some of them were indexes that volunteers have done at later dates because there was not really a, a true and proper index that came with the original publication. But since they've, since then they have been 
more thoroughly indexed, which makes them a lot easier for researchers to use. Um, burial records, um, up in, the, in our library, we have um, index cards that are cross-referenced with published booklets that we have that were published by the um, Genealogical Society. And they'll sell you extra copies of those as well, depending on which count township you're looking for. And those are broken up by township. So, um, you know, a lot of like, I don't, I can never keep all the townships straight and I could never possibly keep straight where the, what cemeteries are in what township. So luckily there's a nice little Ohio cemeteries index book um, that exists for the state. And you can look up under Clark County and it'll tell you um, which, which t uh, cemeteries exist in the county and which townships they're located in. So I use that as a reference all the time to figure out which one's which, because sometimes people will come in and they'll say, oh, I know this person is buried in this cemetery. And I'll say, okay, I'll get to you the cemetery record, but I don't know where that, why do I need to know the township first and then we'll go to the book and get the township. Uh, so those are also cross reference with cards that are there in the, um, the library. So if you have no idea where to start, um, like I mentioned with the marriage cards that we have, you can just go look up by last name and find, hopefully find the person that you're looking for and it'll tell you where they're buried. Uh, we also have the Ferncliff records on um, photocopied uh, cards uh, in the, that are in the genealogy, off, genealogy office um, in the, up on the third floor. And those you can get and it gives you the cause of death and tells you where their plot is. Um, so those are nice because it puts all the families together alphabetically. So if you're looking for an entire plot, you can just go, for, go to that last name and, um, and get a whole bunch of people at once um, alphabetically. It's a little bit more difficult in some cases to search on their website for some of that information because they do have that information on their website now. Um, years ago, they didn't have that stuff on the website. You had to go to their office to get that. Um, we have the Greenmont Records, which is the cemetery that's next to the Westcott House. Um, and that one is very much a mess. <laughs> we, we have the cards, um, but, and we have an original map, but a lot of those cemeteries were, uh, a lot of those graves were moved to Ferncliff at some point. So um, we don't have a very good um, representation of exactly what's there now. Um, there's varying degrees of, of records for that. So that's, that one's kind of a difficult one when people are looking for records there. Um, Find a Grave is a great online resource. Um, it's one that, uh, if you're using Ancestry, they pick up Find a Grave in their search too. So if you're doing a general search on Ancestry, it'll pick up Find a Grave listings. But that'll give you um, oftentimes pictures of the, um, the grave and bios about the person. Those are really great resources. We have clipped obituaries on note cards that are kept in card files. So everybody comes in and they think that we use original card files like they would have in the old libraries. They're, they're, not, they're not original card files. They are, they are um, uh, obituaries. And we have volunteers that keep them up to the present day. So um, when my volunteers started returning last week, they, uh, Bob and Flossie do those. And they came in with two big bags of uh, obituaries just from the last few months that they got onto cards and, and got those up to date into our, in our card file. So I'll, whenever people are coming in looking for obituaries, I usually tell them to start with those cards first. But if they don't find them there, there's an online index, which I have linked down here. Um, the index is for the entire state of Ohio. It's maintained by the Rutherford B. Hayes presidential site. But um, the great thing about it is that it indexes Springfield papers. So it's very useful if you're doing research locally. So um, it'll, it'll give you a month and date for the person that you're looking for. And then we can go to our microfilm to print the original copy. Uh, other resources, we have uh, newspapers on microfilm um, from 1860 to uh, uh, 2019. Um, public library has them as well, but again, I'm not sure what their COVID restrictions are with letting people use their uh, microfilm machines, but usually you, you can do um, newspaper research there. Um, we have original bound newspapers, great big bind, bound books um, between 1829 to the 1970s, and then we have some from the 2000s. Um, people can scan, use a hand scanner for those or take photos. Um, the, I, I usually take photos from those. Uh, and then we have the original New Sun collection. So when they're, th their original building down at um, Limestone and North, when they moved out of there, they gave us about 200 some boxes of, of files and clippings and pictures and negatives and all sorts of stuff um, that came to us. And we have since indexed all of that. So it's make it more accessible to people. 
and then other online uh, resources, newspapers.com, and um, the Library of Congress has um, newspapers available through Chron Chronicling America. Um, that's free. Um, the downside is Springfield papers are not really on there. There's about five papers that span about a five year time frame. So they don't have a, a wide variety that's, that's searchable there, local, that's local papers. But it's good for, um, there's a lot of great stuff on there that you can get to free. If you have a newspapers.com subscription, you can also access a lot of great newspaper stuff. Um, Natalie? Keyword searches. Yeah. If you've got a, a newspaper clipping, but you don't know the date when it was run, mm -hmm. how's the best way? I mean, I know time frame, years. Yeah. To, to, lo to locate it again, it kind of could be a needle, needle in the haystack. I would usually I'll, I'll see, is there anything on the back of that clipping? Is there anything around it that might give me a context clue as to what we're looking for? Like, um, and then narrow it down a little bit. Um, like I had someone that they had seen a picture of their, somebody in their family that had played Santa, shared online, but the date wasn't shared. Uh, and they knew that it was between a five year span. And I looked at it and said, well, it definitely ran on a Sunday because it looks like I've seen our Sunday layouts. It looks like a Sunday layout. So I had a volunteer go through every Sunday in December for that five year span. And we did find it. Um, so if you can narrow down at least to like something small enough and easy enough to look, you might find it. But if, um, if it's too broad, I just tell people there's really not gonna be a way. There's not an index of the newspapers. Although um, starting in the 1970s, there's an online index. I think you might have that on the next page. Yeah, or maybe not. Um, the library's website has an index to newspapers that goes from like 1970 something to 2014. So that's, you can find some, some more modern story things there. Um, and just hope it shows up in the index. But otherwise, yeah, it's, it's difficult to find things like that. So the people and what the papers that you got from the newspaper, did they have individual files on people that they ran a lot of stories on? Yes, they did. So, so they had subject files and they had people files. The people files would have, would have you know, clippings from, for example, they had contacted us when there was going to be a new Wittenberg president and they wanted to do a feature on all the past Wittenberg presidents. So we had to go through the files and get, they gave us a list. Okay, here's all the presidents we know existed. Then we went to the Springfield News Sun files and pulled the file for every single president that was there and scanned all the pictures and articles that we found in there and sent that back to them. Um, so since we have the newspapers collection, whenever they need something now, they do have to come to us if they, if they need to like, you know, do a retrospective or whatever. Um, but yes, they do have um, a lot of people files. They had about 70 boxes of local people and about 70 boxes of non-local people like celebrities and uh, sports figures, musicians, actors, actresses, that kind of thing. Um, My so, aunt that was the deputy clerk. Mm -hmm for the courts for like 30 years. That's who I'm working on in my ah. thing. And she was in a snowstorm, I'm thinking in the late 50s, but it, there's no date on it. So uh, might have a file because she was- There might be, yeah, she might have a file. And she might, she might, we actually, there, 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 we do have a government collection that has some county, long term county employees in it. What was her name? Lola Graham. Yeah, she, I'll, I'll check with you later. She may actually have a collection, <laughs> like a, her own collection. I, her name is familiar. Okay. So I, I'll, I'll see if we can find something. But yeah, um, in general, well, when we do have a lot of like, so these are some of our general surname files. So like Patty, you might want to look at this and see, um, you know, so I'm sure there's an ARC history. If you, if you clicked on this link and did a search for the word ARC, you know, there is an ARC uh, family one in there. Okay. Um, and uh, our general reference files that I'll tell you are, those are our file folders back in the back that maybe just have a little bit of information on a person, an article about them, maybe their birth announcement or their marriage announcement or, you know, random things like that. And then these are a couple of, uh, these are three collections of people that are just, um, were genealogical researchers and these were the files that they kept on research that they had done. So. Um, those are good resources. So when I send this out, you guys will be able to click on all of these um, big long links here. Um, and then to do a search on our website, um, 
and I, I had to change this even though the picture shows Google. Google is not working on our website anymore. I keep emailing our website guy and saying, I don't know why Google does not crawl our website anymore. We're trying to figure out how to fix that, but Bing will still crawl our website. So if you wanted, if you're familiar how to do a site search, um, you go to a whatever search. So like if you're doing a site search for Google, you would put site dash the, the site you're looking for. So ours is heritagecenter.us and then a space and then the keyword you're looking for. So this will bring up everything we have about like General Kiefer, um, this example here. So um, now I do my site searches on Bing um, because Google does not like our website at the moment, but um, that's how you can do a search of, you know, it'll tell you everything we have on a certain name. So like Patty, if you were to put in the word ARC, it will tell you everywhere that the name ARC appears in um, the archives. Um, and then here's some roadblocks that you, if you've already started this, um, and, and just things to keep in mind when you're doing your research. Um, a lot of people will change the name that they go by. I'll see sometimes uh, men especially will go by initials only, first and first name and middle initial, um, or first, you know, first initial and middle initial. Um, and they'll change it over the years. So you might see in one census year they appear with their full name and another year they'll appear with their initials or um, sometimes women go by their middle names or sometimes um, like we have a handy little little book that tells you a lot of the nicknames that are for um, various things like Polly is a nickname for Mary. <laughs> I don't know why, but you know, it's, but someone might appear as Polly or they might appear another time as Mary and you might, you might deduct by their age or birth date that yes, that is the same person. They're just going by a different name. So I always tell people that try a variety of names. And when people write us or call us to do research, they'll usually give us a list saying, you know, here's the last name I'm looking for. It can be spelled this way, this way, this way, or this way. So when I do a search, I have to search for all the different ways. Um, so, I, so I have on here, spelling does not count. And, and you'll find if you've done research, it changes a lot over the years, especially if you have a name that might be more complicated, um, that, that it, would, it would change a lot um, between, between rec records. Um, so if you're, when you start doing research, you might want to keep a list of all the varying spellings that you've run into. So if you're contacting someone else to do research for you, they know which variations to check. Um, Nat Natalie? Yeah. I have a question. Okay. Um, do you do research for other people? Can we hire you to do research for us? Yes. We'll, I'll do research for stuff that's available in the Heritage Center records and online. I like, if it's something that we have to go, I'd have to go beyond our building. Like um, I don't, I don't go to, I don't go to probate court or, um, but Flossie does, uh, Flossie Holsizer, she'll do that. Um, she'll go out of the building for stuff. But yeah, we, a lot of our research, um, people that can't come in, I do the research for them. And um, some, some things, depending on how, how quick it, really quick, um, search and it takes me just a second to send them like a birth record, I don't charge them for it at all. But depending on what it is, there might just be like, a, I charge you for copies, however, of whatever I found or, or things like that. So um, yes, we, we do research for people. Uh, um, back to the, the tips that we have, um, if you're doing an online search, um, I do, I use Ancestry a lot and I'll just do their general search function, um, which is in the middle of the page and you scroll down a little bit under search and I'll just go there first because that's your overall, it'll search across all records that they have available. And um, I'll put in just whatever I know. So it's, so your, your chances of finding what you're, or finding something, at least, you know, a grain to, to hold on to um, is to put in less, in, put, put in um, less information, not be exact. So you don't necessarily want to have exact match checked because that will cut down your possibilities a lot. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is that there's a lot of spelling errors in transcriptions because the transcriptions on the census records are done by volunteers. So we're relying on the volunteer to be able to read that page properly. Um, so one good thing about Ancestry is that if you see a um, incorrect spelling on it, like if you found your family name finally and you realize that it was not picking, picked up in the index because it was spelled wrong, you can submit a correction um, to the transcription right then and there on the page, you know, there's a little thing you can click on that says, you know, do you have a correction and you can submit that um, so that that'll help future researchers. Um, like I know when the 1940 census came out, my family names on both sides were spelled wrong. <laughs> so they would never have been picked up in the index, uh, but I submitted a, a correction so they would be picked up right. 
Um, so, um, like I said, on Ancestry, make your, your, your search as basic as you can. Um, fill in whatever you do know. So if you know a death date, for sure, like an exact death date or year, put that in and that'll narrow down your search more. Um, and don't give up after one search. I always try, you know, a whole bunch of different spellings or names or variations. Um, and then at the end here, I just have some fun things to do with your family history once you found it. Um, you can make little fun uh, trading cards. Um, I think I've mentioned this in another program of things to do with your, if you, if you are the person that holds family heirlooms, like if you're Patty, Patty's just giving them all to the Heritage Center. But if she were keeping them home, she might take a picture of them and make a little card that says, this is why this thing is important. And this is who it belonged to. And this is the dates that it was used or things like that. Um, and those are things that you can pass on to other family members to, so that they know why these things are important. But this is a, you know, a little book made out of family recipe cards. Um, quilts made out of family photos, puzzles made out of family photos, ornaments. Um, this is tea towels made out of recipes and these are little, little jewelry made out of um, family photos. So fun things that you can do with this stuff once you've found the family history. That's what I love about Ancestry. Um, it connects you to other people's trees and a lot of times people have pictures on their tree that you did not have. Um, so uh, even though it's a paid service, I find it's, it's, I, I found it, it's definitely worth it for us to have it. And my family tree is connected to the an ancestor too. So I've got a lot of great stuff on there. And then I just left, um, you'll have these on here, uh, resources for the other class I talked about, um, how to preserve your stuff. I wanted to throw in some, you know, once you're finding these things, here's where you can store this stuff to keep it safe. Um, and then a couple other resources. Oh, here's that index um, that I mentioned that the library has. Oh, it goes through 2008. Um, so that's how you can search newspapers there. Um, and then the recorder's office, there's how you can search uh, past a certain year. I've got a link down there that will take you to um, do more search on the recorder's office. And then um, you can always willing to help um, the library. Uh, um, Kathy Hackett and her people are, are great. Um, and then when the Genealogical Society is meeting, they're not meeting right now because of COVID, but they usually meet the second Saturday of every month at the Park Branch Library on Bechtel. And they are great. And they're willing to help you as well. And then you can always hire a professional genealogist, um, Diane. This is the website where you can you can search for um, people that are. You have to pass all these special tests to become a certified professional genealogist. But that's where you can find those people. And then I've got my contact information on there. And right now we're open by appointment, but hopefully we'll eventually be back open where you can just pop in and ask questions. <laughs>